Thanks so much for joining us for today's edition of Alaska Weather. I'm Dave Percy, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and I'll be hosting this Tuesday's show on the 19th day of October 2021, again uh, for today. Moving on to, uh, let's see, first up, hazardous weather graphic. We've got uh, winter weather advisory out for tonight for the eastern Arctic coast, eastern Wolfert Sea coast. And that's for uh, snow and blowing snow, which could reduce visibilities to half a mile or less at times due to winds that are 25 to 35 miles an hour with gusts of 50 miles per hour. And then there's also, and again, that's out tonight, also a uh, wind advisory out from midnight tonight until 6 a.m. Wednesday morning for the Eastern Alaska Range, west of the Toe Cutoff, through the passes of the Eastern Alaska Range, west of the Toe Cutoff. And again, that's from midnight to 6 a.m. So six hour period there, low pressure tracking northwestward, tightening the gradient up uh, and will produce wind gusts to uh, 55 miles per hour with sustained winds of 25 to 35 miles an hour. Otherwise, uh, that's it for the watches and warnings. So right to satellite imagery, you can see that low center uh, very vividly there in the Gulf of Alaska tracking northwestward and uh, kind of uh, translating itself northwestward there with the uh, back edge of the front already up uh, to just south of Fairbanks along the Alaska Range. But the main low center is still uh, over southern Prince William Sound right now, and that brought uh, bringing strong winds, uh, gusts to 63 miles an hour, peak wind gust Middleton Island this afternoon. Portage uh, had gusts to 71 miles per hour with that low tracking just to the west there, actually still a little bit to the south. And uh, rainfall with the front uh, as it pushes into the eastern North Gulf Coast, uh, well, range from about a tenth of an inch at uh, Cordova but Yakutat had, had over an inch of rain in the 12-hour period, period ending at 2 p.m. this afternoon. And then lighter amounts, but some about a half inch pushing into the uh, Glacier Bay area in some locations, but otherwise uh, the heaviest rain-producing clouds or the main rain-producing clouds still off the coast of the Panhandle, but that'll be edging its way eastward tonight and into tomorrow's the front weekends. Out to the west, that other front, uh, Pushing eastward brought uh, three inches of snow to Russian Mission and three inches of snow to Nome, a couple of the heavier precipitation amounts there, otherwise lighter amounts most everywhere. And uh, west winds behind that swinging into the Pribilof Islands, 45 to 50 miles an hour in gusts, same thing for the Alaska Peninsula. Uh, cold air dropping out of the Russian Far East, uh, you can tell by the open cell queue there, but that uh, doesn't quite reach the Aleutians, a little bit toward Adak and Atka. Kind of a break for Amchitka to Shimmy ahead of the next system. You can see the cloud shield associated with that that'll uh, signifying the big storm coming into the Bering Sea. But today, low pressure just south of uh, St. Lawrence Island and the high south of the Aleutians. Uh, in between the two, gradient uh, winds gusting as high as 60 miles an hour or more at the buoy 35 west of the Pribilof. So I mentioned 45 to 50 over the Pribilof, but big area of west-northwest winds right into the eastern Aleutians, Alaska Peninsula. And that front pulling, or the low center pulling northward. Tonight could bring 50 mile an hour wind gusts to uh, the mountain pass of south central Alaska, Chugach Mountains, East Anchorage. Could see 50 mile an hour wind gusts as uh, that tracks northward and weakens this evening with uh, rain or rain and snow, depending on your elevation, stays wet or becomes wetter over the panhandle. Snow flurries along the Arctic coast and north slope continue. And again, the winter weather advisories go along with that. Uh, even be pretty gusty on the winds on the west side, but uh, due to offshore flow, visibility will be a little better. And then for tomorrow, next big storm enters the southwest Bering Sea there with a the frontal system. Rain heavy at times, storm force winds, gale winds, and then other low tracks northwestward toward the Kenai Peninsula coast tomorrow afternoon. But it'll be a little weaker than one today. And that front uh, having trouble pushing in, but some rain should spread over much of the southeast coast tomorrow afternoon. And then for Thursday, intense storm moves to just west of the Pribilof Islands. Look for uh, definitely possible hurricane force winds on the west and southwest flank of that system there, that tight gradient. 
Uh, definitely storm force winds, uh, 60 knots on the Bering Sea side of the Alaska Peninsula for the eastern Aleutians. Gales coming into the Alaska Peninsula, wave forming just south of the peninsula there, but look for a big increased wind and rain for the southwest coast in the afternoon. Showers south central Alaska dry over the interior, chance of rain now southern southeast coast. Lows for tonight, uh, mild 40s for the Panhandle, otherwise 30s. Lower to mid for South Central Alaska, mid 20s for the Northern Cuscombe Valley, Copper River Basin, upper 20s, Bristol Bay. Highs tomorrow, mid 30s, west of the Alaska Range, otherwise 40s to near 50 elsewhere. Warmest in the Panhandle, lows 25 to 30 for Thursday morning, 20s for the Cuscombe Valley, Bristol Bay, still in the 40s for the Panhandle, mid 30s, Kodiak Island, followed by highs 40 to 45 most areas west of the Alaska Range in the mid 30s, 35 to 40 Bristol Bay, and all at, everywhere in the 50s for the Panhandle. Up north, uh, lows tonight, teens and 20s, uh, milder 31 Fairbanks and St. Lawrence Island, highs tomorrow, mid to upper 30s over the interior to uh, 25 to 30 North Slope Arctic Coast. Followed by lows up uh, teens, 15 to 20, north of the Brooks Range, south of the Brooks Range in the 20s, and then highs will be lower to mid 30s, south of the Brooks Range for the Brooks Range on out in the mid to upper 20s. And for the southwest coast, uh, lower 30s along the coastline for bluffs, upper 30s Aleutians, mid to upper 30s Alaska Peninsula, lower 40s for the western Aleutians, followed by highs in the 40s, near 40 along the coast, 35 for St. Lawrence Island, lows upper 30s and near 40, and highs in the 30s along the coast, mid 40s, Aleutian. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. For th uh, Wednesday morning, we've got IFR there, central eastern Arctic coast, uh, Brooks Range into the interior and eastern interior, Copper River Basin, all VFR, Bristol Bay VFR, Alaska Peninsula, and most of the Aleutians, VFR, just some marginal VFR there, a narrow band from west of uh, Shimeanat 2 to just east of Amchitka. IFR, St. Lawrence Island, uh, southern Seward Peninsula, most of Norton Sound, then up catching the uh, area from just north of Kivalina to Point Hope, maybe Cape Lisbon. IFR, eastern Kenai Peninsula, western Prince William Sound, and the North Gulf Coast Range, marginal VFR along the Panhandle. And for the afternoon, we'll see uh, marginal VFR southeast coast, IFR eastern North Gulf Coast to near Elfin Cove, and some IFR in across south central Alaska and uh, parts of the Copper River Basin. Otherwise, uh, a lot of VFR from the southeast Bering Pribilofs, Alaska Peninsula, Kodiak Island, and much interior Alaska. VFR, some marginal VFR central eastern Arctic coast, IFR, uh, Kotzebue Sound. Seward Peninsula to St. Lawrence Island. And for Thursday, big storm, a lot of IFR associated with it coming into the Bering Sea, moving eastward, covering the Pribilofs during the afternoon. And from Adak all the way up to about Sand Point on the Alaska Peninsula. Farther to the east, VFR, southwest coast, Bristol Bay, Kodiak Island, narrow bend of IFR from the northwest coast into the uh, Koyukuk Valley, Kobuk Valley, give or take there down across Yukon River into the Susitna, Manuska Valley, Northern Cook Inlet, both turn again connect arms, and uh, basically the North Gulf Coast and some up along the Eastern Alaska Range. Some marginal VFR, not too bad for the Panhandle there with uh, VFR down uh, over the Central and Southern areas, marginal VFR along the coast. And then for the afternoon, that area of IFR hits the Southwest Coast, Togiak Bay up into the Southwest Mountains. Uh, some IFR there, Western Seward Peninsula, uh, or the Bering Strait, western St. Lawrence Island, up to the northwest coast in the Notak Valley, southern slopes of the western Brooks Range, real narrow bend IFR, eastern Arctic coast, and some IFR, southern slopes of the Alaska Range, and northern Prince William Sound, and uh, maybe the Talkeetnas, otherwise VFR Kodiak Island, and just about everywhere else. Aleutians looking really good. And for the uh, passes tomorrow, both Anatovic and Anagan, VFR. Western Alaska Range, Lake Clark and Merrill, IFR becoming marginal in the afternoon. Rainy, occasionally marginal throughout the day. Windy, though, VFR. And Isabel, VFR with some marginal VFR as moisture spreads up from the south and southeast. And then for Mentasta, VFR, but southern entrance, possible marginal VFR there. And for Tineda, VFR becoming marginal in the afternoon. And for Portage, marginal VFR, eastern entrance, socked in with IFR the entire day, and for Chilkoot and White, marginal VFR. 
Looking at the freezing level surface up to near St. Lawrence Island along the southwest coast, north coast of Bristol Bay, up along the north Gulf Coast or just off tomorrow morning and then across the Panhandle, 2,000 feet pushing into the eastern interior all the way to the eastern Arctic coast and up over the western Aleutians. Icing, uh, considerable moderate that flow, southeast flow continuing to put surges of moisture and other system coming up. So during the afternoon hours, look for some considerable moderate rime icing to move into Prince William Sound, eastern north Gulf Coast. Big area of icing out there to the west, so you that next big storm coming in southwest Bering, spreading eastward halfway to Nikolski from Atka Island and the jet stream. Some ridging in advance of that big storm, but pretty good flow right through that ridge, kind of a flat ridge there, north-northwest at 170 knots, Alaska Peninsula, and then 155 knots southwest of the western Aleutians, otherwise southerly flow over mainland Alaska, 40 to 65 knots, 85 knots there just north of the Yukon River. And at 9,000 feet, suddenly it's 55 knots. North Gulf Coast is at next low tracks uh, northwestward into the Kenai Peninsula. Otherwise, 20 to 30 knot winds from the south, basically over the western northern interior, and 65 knot northwest winds over the Alaska Peninsula, False Pass, and on Alaska Island. 3,000 feet, westerlies at 35 knots, central Bering Sea turned northwest and increased to 40 knots across the Alaska Peninsula. Pretty light variable winds on uh, mainland Alaska from the Arctic coast down to the uh, Cook Inlet area, Kodiak, but with that low tracking northwestward again up toward the North Gulf Coast, or actually Prince William Sound, 65 knot winds in a little narrow area that hitting the eastern North Gulf Coast. Stronger winds out west, turbulence wise, moderate chop, Alaska Peninsula, western central Aleutians, and all of the eastern North Gulf Coast down along a good portion of southeast Alaska. I can't really name anyone that has so much integrity as she does to the things that she's accomplishing. It's pretty amazing. Having Claire as a role model, just a strong woman in science and just so smart and so kind. It's just a huge confidence booster is that, hey, I could do that too, you know? That's, that's possible, that's successful, that's what I want to do. I would characterize her as a pioneer in the field. The amount and uh, quality of the work she's put out is, is uh, second to none. I know people who have a lot of tenacity. I know people that have integrity, but it's rare that people have both together in that you know, that combination that Claire does. Every morning, Dr. Claire Parkinson gets up before sunrise and runs two miles to work. She hasn't missed a day in nearly 40 years. To know the evolution of sea ice and how we observe it from space is to know Claire. This year, she's celebrating 40 years at NASA. When I arrived at Goddard, which was in July of 1978, it was an incredibly exciting period here. Satellites were pretty new, but a lot of data had been collected. NASA scientists were inundated with information, and Claire was in a cohort looking at sea ice, trying to make sense of a jumble of very raw, very new data. It was around that time that Claire and her team, at the time led by Dr. Jay Zwally, created the principal sea ice record that we use today. How does something like that record help you do your job? Oh, <laughs> that record is fundamental to understanding sea ice. So without it, we wouldn't know how rapidly it's changing. You may not realize it, but Claire's work studying the changing extent of the ice caps deeply affected our understanding of climate change, and relatedly, our understanding of how climate change affects life on Earth. One of the clearest 
signals for climate change that uh, resonates with people has been this shrinking of the polar ice cap in the summer that we're able to see because of uh, Claire's work. After we had a record that was about 15, 20 years long, we started noticing that the extent of the ice in the Arctic was getting smaller over time. Sea ice is formed on the surface of the ocean and therefore is made from seawater. The biggest concentration is in the Arctic and it's also where the biggest loss in sea ice is occurring. Every year NASA reports on the sea ice minimum and maximum extents. As expected, the data is concerning. By now, not only has this trend toward lesser ice continued, but it's even accelerated so that now the decreases are greater than what they had been. These trends are deeply troubling, but one thing's for sure. Our awareness of shrinking sea ice extent due to climate change was propelled faster and further after Claire Parkinson arrived at NASA. I mean, she takes her job seriously and the health and welfare of those instruments in space. Yeah, she's, she's on it, you know? It's uh, one of the things you don't worry about because Claire's in the loop on these things. It's, it's gonna be fine. In science, we stand on the shoulders of giants, on the shoulders of those who explored before us. But then, some among us are giants. For a scientist, it's incredibly exciting to be studying these glaciers and ice sheets right now because they're doing something that hasn't happened in thousands of years. We're watching changes take place that haven't happened since the end of the last ice age. Tuesday was cold, I almost froze my toes. Oh, what's it gonna be next week? Who knows that's climate. Oh, that's the climate you got. You take a bunch of weather and you average it together and you're doing the climate rock. glacial pace. It means something's happening so slowly you can barely tell it's happening at all. That used to describe the very incremental movement glaciers and ice sheets experienced each year. But now that's changing. We're tagging along with three NASA scientists to understand the different lengths they go to to not only investigate ice sheets and glaciers, but also communicate their often complicated science to the public. First, let's get oriented. Ice sheets, in pink, pretty much occur in only two places, Antarctica and Greenland. Glaciers in yellow play a key role draining melt off the ice sheet. Glaciers are also found in the high mountains, but we'll get to those in another episode. So we know that something's happening in Greenland right now that's unprecedented in the last several thousand years. That's Dr. Josh Willis, oceanographer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Josh and his team are tackling one of the major environmental challenges of the 21st century, trying to answer fundamental questions about how melting glaciers impact sea level rise. With my mission, Oceans Melting Greenland, or OMG for short, we're trying to understand just how much of Greenland's melt is caused by the oceans. Along with being one of NASA's top scientists working on the cryosphere, Josh is passionate about demystifying climate change in typically unconventional ways. I think by reaching out to people with a little bit of humor, a little bit of fun, maybe a song, you really have the opportunity to help people understand and come to terms with what we're doing to our planet. Because it's definitely happening and it's definitely a big deal and we need to start preparing for it. Down at the opposite pole, Dr. Kelly Brunt is getting ready for a major expedition. In December and January this coming year, uh, I'll actually be in Antarctica, down near the South Pole, collecting ground-based GPS data. 
This is actually Kelly's second expedition to the South Pole. The first occurred in December and January of last year. Both surveys are critical and will help validate data collected by NASA's airborne campaign, Operation Icebridge, and the recently launched satellite mission ISAT-2. All three of these layers, that ground base, that airborne, and the satellite are all tied together. The ground base helps validate both the satellite and the airborne, and the airborne helps give us more validation data for the satellites, but also a bigger story with respect to the depth of the ice sheet and what's going on underneath the surface. While some scientists are taking measurements in the field, others are looking for answers in physics and lines of code. For me, the, the projections that we, that we are doing, they do have a, a very personal meaning. Dr. Sophie Nowicki is an ice sheet modeler. That means she and her team have the important job of forecasting how ice will change in the future, which also predicts changes in sea level rise. It's a job she doesn't take lightly, especially since urban planning and infrastructure use her team's models to make decisions about the future and safety of their communities. When we make those projections that are 100 years in the future, 100 years can seem so far away, like I don't have to worry about it, it's just too far. But actually they are not. It's really like the future that we are looking at that our children, our grandchildren will see to experience. Whether it's learning to communicate in new ways, traversing a swath of Antarctica in a massive piston bully, or taking responsibility for an impactful climate forecast, our NASA explorers are pushing the limits of discovery every day. But on a very human level, they're people with families and friends who have a stake in finding out why and how the planet is changing as rapidly as it is. Every place, at least so far, that we have found life, we found water along with it. And so when we try to understand uh, the thresholds for life, where life might exist, elsewhere in our solar system and the universe. Water is one of those things that we look for. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. Uh, comparing the sea ice analysis uh, today to three days ago, this is October 16th here, you can see it makes a really good jog to the south across the whole area there. Uh, let's see, right there you can see um, really closing in, especially on the eastern Beaufort Sea coast with it expanding outward away from the shore a little bit and more so coming down from the north. And it looks like it would reach, close off there just on momentum alone, but we'll have to wait and see. So moving on to coastal water forecasts. Gale warnings tomorrow for the southeast coast. South coast, southeast 35 knots. North coast, east 30 to 35 knots. Seas around 17 feet. Central and northern inside waters, variable to northwest winds at 15 knots, and southeast winds 20 knots with four foot seas for Clarence Strait. And the outlook for Thursday, gale warnings on the south coast. East winds 35 to 40 knots, seas around 20 feet. Small craft advisories on the north coast, east winds 25 to 30 knots. Lynn Canal looking at a north wind at 20 knots with four foot seas. Stevens Passage northeast at 20. And small craft advisories for Clarence Strait for southeast winds at 25 knots with five foot seas. And for Prince William Sound tomorrow, east winds 15 knots, seas three feet, light northerlies at 10 knots for Cook Inlet, and northwest winds at 20 for Kamishak Bay, but the Barrett Islands southeast winds 20 knots with 10 foot seas, light variable winds for the western north gulf coast, and southeast winds of 15 knots for the eastern north gulf coast. And for Thursday, Small craft advisories, Barren Islands and Kamishak Bay, southeast winds 25 knots, 6 to 8 foot seas. South of the Forelands and Cook Inlet, winds will be east at 20 knots. North side there, north at 15 and Prince William Sound, east winds of 15 knots. Kodiak Island for Wednesday, northwest winds 20 to 25 knots and 30 to 35 knot westerlies for the Alaska Peninsula. Small craft advisories for Bristol Bay, west winds at 25 knots. Big increase in the winds on Thursday as that storm comes in from the west with uh, storm warnings for the Alaska Peninsula, south southwest 50 knots, seas around 30 feet. Full or definitely full gales for Bristol Bay, southeast at 45 knots, seas building to 11 feet and 40 knot winds from Castle Cape to Sitkanak. Small craft advisories, Kodiak Island, south southeast winds at 30 knots. And for Wednesday, eastern Aleutians. West winds, 30 to 35 knots, seas running 14 to 21 feet, 
ADAC and ATCA, depending on which side of the island you're on, if you're on the Pacific side, look for gale warnings for south winds at 35 knots, Bering Sea side, west at 30 knots, south 40 knots on Chitka Island, Kiska to Shimia, southeast winds 40 knots. For Thursday, with that strong, intense low center tracking to near the Pribilof Island, south side of that sea uh, winds, high end storm force winds of 50 to 60 knots there. On, from the north side of the Atka Island to the eastern Aleutians. Otherwise, uh, storm warnings for the uh, Pacific side of the Fox Islands, west 50 knots, 45 knots from the west Pacific side, Adak and Atka, west 40 for Amchitka, west 35, Shimiatu and Kiska. Southwest coast tomorrow, west winds 25 knots, gale warnings for the Pribilof Islands, west at 35 knots, 21 foot seas. West 30 knots, St. Matthew Island, and West 20 for St. Lawrence Island, sees it around 11 feet. And the next day, gale warnings into the picture. Prayer loss, uh, just under storm force, 45 knots near the low center there, sees around 20 feet. East, 45 knots, Cuscombe Delta Coast. East, 40 knots, Yukon Delta Coast. Northeast at 40 for St. Matthew Island. St. Lawrence Island, Norton Sound. Southeast winds 20 knots, three to five foot seas. And for Wednesday, gale warnings, eastern Arctic coast there, uh, Kaktovic demarcation point or Barter Island keep, uh, to demarcation point, 35 knots out of the east, central and uh, remainder of the coastline, east northeast at 30 knots, and Cape Thompson to Cape Beaufort east at 25, southeast 15 for Wales to Cape Thompson. And for Thursday, small craft advisories, Wales to Cape Thompson, south 25 knots, southeast winds 10 to 20 knots for the western Arctic coast, and really laying down a uh, variable to east at five knots there for the eastern Boulevard Sea Coast. He's coming down to three feet or less. And uh, look for areas of snow and uh, winter weather advisory out tonight for the eastern Boulevard Sea Coast. Snow and blowing snow deuce visibilities to half mile or less at times with uh, gusty winds to 30 to 40 miles an hour. Weakening front brings moisture into the Cuscom Valley, snow for the Seward Peninsula. And uh, low tracking north will bring gusty winds across south central Alaska this evening, possibly to 50 miles an hour, Anchorage hillside. Wind and rain increase for the Panhandle. Next big storm tracks eastward into the Bering Sea and becomes quite intense near the Pribilofs in the afternoon. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.